Year 13. Nicole Kozoff. Well, hello, you bearded bastards, and welcome back once again to Nicole Kozoff. I shall al de Sathgeshad Rosh. Skull Horror. The Frigid South Nightmare Fortress of Death. And yes, you did see that correctly. We are now in our 13th year here in the fortress, and swiftly approaching our 14th actually. Now you may remember just at the end of last episode we were at year 8, and so that means 5, almost 6 years have passed, and Nicole Kozoff is trucking along at a fairly geologic pace. Very slowly that is, but we are progressing and getting a bunch of projects done. A lot of tedious stuff really, and surprisingly we're able to keep it together very well. Now then, let's see. Where to start? Well, first off, up here on the surface, yes, I know it's painful to look at, but bear with me. There are a ton of zombies up here, and there are more every year. And just in case you were wondering, this zombie here, uh, those are its entrails trailing behind it in the snow. I just want to make sure you knew what you were looking at. Oh, and actually, I just realized this is Rakust, the outpost liaison for our civilization, and a dwarf who was depicted on that nice table artifact from last episode. Small world, right? Anyways, uh, yes, in that intro, you may have noticed this area over here, an area we've dubbed Slime Town. A lot of migrants have been showing up recently, like a whole lot. We just expel them as soon as they get onto the map, but there was one group of about seven dwarves that were trying to utilize the supplies that came from a destroyed merchant caravan to make some sort of a little uh, inhabitable area down here. You can see they've carved a pit here and started building up a wall around the pit using this red clay. And then looking down a bit, you can see a couple of corpses. There are no dwarves here anymore. Unfortunately, they couldn't make it out here. A couple of them were killed by a giant porcupine. A giant porcupine corpse, that is. And the rest started dying of dehydration, so I just ended up exiling them and they all left. Couldn't blame them, really. It was an interesting project, but not one that could really work, I don't think. But we'll have to see. Maybe another group will take a stab at getting Slime Town up and running. Moving on. Something very important to note that took place in these past couple of years is that Rakust, our expedition leader, is no longer the leader of the fortress. No, at some point along the way, we decided to start voting for a mayor. And ever since that's been the case, Rakust has not regained leadership. She's a pretty good sport about it. And in fact, we decided to make her the taskmaster of the fortress the manager and bookkeeper. And she's doing a damn fine job at it too. The new leader of Nicole Kazoff, our mayor, is Kalovi Thesiemi, the grumpy old lady poet who came in that first migrant wave many years ago. Now this here is a very interesting dwarf and I've become a very big fan of her. Now just hold on a second because we're gonna take a deep dive into her history. And here we are. Kalovi, or Amost, her real dwarven name, Amost Rockbelt was born in 144, making her 147 years old. So she's getting up there. Dwarves only tend to live from 150 to 170 years. Just keep that in mind. Now, the first 60 years of her life or so were pretty boring, I would imagine. But then in 203, she became a scout, and the following year, she married Kogan Basement Constructs, and also settled in Wandered Embrace. And that's also the year she began scouting and she visited Poked Kindness to gather information, where she fooled the adoration of dimensions into believing she was the poet Kalovi Fishquick, which is where she got that name from. Oh, and the adoration of dimensions is an elven civilization. What followed was a fairly lengthy scouting career, where she visited several elven settlements, and she continued scouting for the dwarves until 252, which is the year she moved to Water Island, the wet ocean kingdom of fishers which was a strange dwarven fortress built out on the sea that has since crumbled. Now, what I found strange was that while she was there, she became the broker of those dwarves, much like she was here at our fortress for many, many years. But she was expelled from the place eventually, which is probably the only reason she survived. After being expelled, she bounced around for a couple of years, during which time she lost her husband and both of her children. And then eventually in 279, she became a member of the Crazy Skulls and she joined us here in Skull Horror. And we are very glad to have her. Quite a dwarf, I'll tell you. Big fan of armor stands, huge fan. And that is A-OK, -okay. they're extremely easy to make, so whenever she mandates their construction, we're right on it. Oh, and you know what? You wanna see her bedroom? I'm sure you do. Let's have a look. It's fairly standard, really, right towards the front of the bedroom quarter. There's a nice praise window like the other five starting dwarves' bedrooms, as well as a gold statue of a goblin and a turkey, because those are two things she's a big fan of. She likes goblins for their menacing features, 
and turkeys for their waddle. So I figured, what the hell? We'll make a statue of it. She deserves it. Gold-plated floor. Yeah, it's not too bad. Moving on, we have Sodell's bedroom. Nothing of note here except for a broken gem window, which I imagine is Twitch's doing. Yeah, we'll get to her in a bit. I'll need someone over here to replace this window. Let's get to it. Down next to Sodell's bedroom, we have Twitch's bedroom. And you can see there's a lot going on in here. Gold-plated floor, praise windows, gold cage, gold chain, and an artifact quern, making this here a royal bedroom. The most well-appointed in the entire fortress. But it still was not enough to pull her out of her crappy mood. Again, we'll get to that in a second. Here we have Einod's bedroom, standard, Bomrek's bedroom, our sheriff, which I had intended to put two gold cages in, empty cages, but instead they were filled with zombies. Uh, it was an accident, but he doesn't seem to mind at all. And so I figured, what the hell? You like those zombie cages? You can have them. Rakhust's bedroom, the fortress taskmaster, two empty gold cages. And next to her, we have Liebash's bedroom. That's the other miserable dwarf from last episode. She's still miserable. She doesn't throw tantrums like Twitch does, but nothing can pull her out of her slump. Her family's not here and she's all alone. Pretty sure that's all she could focus on. Can't really blame her. Oh, and then one more bedroom I'd like to show off right up here. Uh, this is Domas's bedroom. The dwarf who had their leg pulled off by that ghost last episode. Remember that? Yeah, we decided to put a pedestal in there and we put the desiccated remains of that leg on this pedestal. It's a nice touch. You know, didn't want to just throw the thing out. That'd be wasteful. And just in case you saw it, over here, we dug out three new bedrooms because I just realized the three of the fortress children did not have bedrooms these past five years. And so they were sleeping in the prison, which is awful but it's the only beds they could find. Uh, so yeah, that's also why we put gold on the floor, just as kind of an apology. Sorry, kids. <laughs> Down here in our meeting hall, which is hardly ever used, you can see the mist generator billowing out mist, of course. And right in front of it, we have a golden pedestal and placed atop that is braved palms, the rasp of emancipating, the horn of skull horror, I'd still really like to do something with that, but this is fine for now. Over here in this main hub area, you can see all the gold on the floors, as well as all these gold statues of laughing dead dwarves. Yeah, there's a lot of gold. We've been using it liberally, and unfortunately we're starting to run out. <laughs> well, that'll pretty much do it for the changes up here in our living area, and so now let's turn our attention towards a Twitch. Yes, she's been a real pain in the butt these past few years. She did manage to keep it together fairly well for a couple of years. You saw she was throwing tantrums last episode, but she kind of cut that out, but has only just recently started picking that habit up again. And strangely enough, uh, she never gets in trouble for it. Like nobody reports her crimes, which I find strange. There's even been a couple of instances that I witnessed where she went up to Kalovi and just attacked her again, just like last episode, remember that? It happened two more times. Luckily, Clovey didn't take any damage and didn't retaliate either. The two of them will just go back to Clovey's bedroom, have a meeting, and then resume business as usual. Very strange. It's almost like they feel for this dwarf or something. Kind of just give her a break. I don't know. If she ends up killing someone, I'm not going to be very happy about it. And if she dies, I'm not going to be happy about it either, of course, but I don't know. It kind of seems inevitable at this point. I think she's sliding away from us. Well, I suppose we could keep looking at some of our notable dwarves. Right here, you can see that baby. This little baby suffered some trauma in these past couple years. A ghost had came back from the dead and assaulted that baby, battered her, like that dwarf who lost their leg. But that baby actually came out pretty well. She got a big gash on her chest, but that was about it. She made a full recovery and is doing very well and is certainly not a baby anymore. No, in fact, she's 10 years old, which is just wild. You know, she was born last episode, so just crazy, really. In two more years, she'll be a peasant and can start working for the fortress, which is very exciting. Can't help but wonder what she'll make of herself. Over here, hanging out in her bedroom, we could see Pig, that baby's older sister. And you know, I guess I assumed she was a bit older than that baby, but that is not the case. <laughs> no, she's 10 as well. I did check they're not twins, but they were both born in the same year. Pretty wild, really. She too is doing very well. A very even-keeled dwarf, despite the terrible nickname. Over here, we can see another child, Sarvesh. Not one we had seen before, but one who I found quite notable. Huh, let's uh, hold up a second here. What the hell are the chances of that? Here we have that baby, just had a strange mood, and is going to attempt to make an artifact. That is fascinating. All right, well, I'm going to leave her to it. We'll get back to her when she does create it, hoping she is successful. I will be devastated if she's not. Anyways, yes, Sarvesh, this child over here. Um, you know, 
I can't help but feel that Sarvesh here was the one intended to have the nickname Pig and is probably a little upset that she didn't get it. You see, she made an artifact a few years ago. Nunub of Umam, the Punch of Savants, a Gabbro figurine of pigs. And what the hell, we'll take a quick look at the thing. This is a Gabbro figurine of pigs. All craft ship is of the highest quality. The item is a masterfully designed image of pigs in Gabbro by Sarvesh Rigoth Kang. It is encrusted with rose-cut morions, decorated with pig leather and pigtail, and encircled with bands of trillion-cut green glass gems, tunnel tube, and silver. It also menaces with spikes of tunnel tube. And also on the item is an image of a radiant-cut gem in Gabbro. A decent artifact, not too bad at all. Pigs, something that Sarvesh is a big fan of. In fact, little Sarvesh here has two pet pigs, Ingiz and Rith. I decided a couple years ago to make a bunch of the pigs acceptable as pets just to see if any dwarves would want them, and Sarvesh was very quick to grab up a couple. Sarvesh likes pigs for their sense of smell. You know, I don't feel right about not giving you a nickname. I'm sorry it can't be pig, there's already a pig in the fortress, and so looking at your description, uh, a very happy and optimistic dwarf, never discouraged. Huh. And when she's surprised, she has a very unique laugh. Okay, Sarvesh, I think for your nickname, we'll go with... A squealer. I'm terribly sorry. Keep on keeping on, Squealer. Another dwarf I'd like to mention is Olin, one of our workers, who took all the other pigs that were available for taking as pets. So she has four of them right now, which is pretty wild. She has no other family in the fortress, and so she only has the pigs, which is absolutely fine. You know what? I think we'll come up with a nickname for you as well, Olin, just for the heck of it. And that nickname will be mm, Smelly, which is a terrible nickname once again. But, you know, I figure you hang out with pigs all day. Um, yeah, some nicknames just stick, I guess. Sorry, Smelly. Checking back in on that baby. Still getting some materials here. Hauling a boulder up, it seems. And she's off once more to collect some more materials. Good luck, that baby. I'm gonna say it again, if she does not create that artifact, I will be devastated. Now then, moving on. And down to our library. You may notice it's not absolutely stuffed with scholars. I know I had raised the idea that this could be a scholar fortress, but really when you come down to it, this entire time we've had to be working in the fortress. And so we haven't had too much time to be scholars. That being said, well, a couple years ago, I decided to make all the dwarves in the fortress scholars, like I did that first time. And I just kept them that way until we had a couple of books written. Two books, written by Nil and Erel. And after they did that, I sent all the dwarves back to work except for those two. And now those two are our full-time scholars here in the fortress. And actually, I just assigned a third as well, Phycod. They were a woodcutter, but there's been surprisingly little wood to cut in these past five years because the caverns have been completely sealed up. And plus, they were kind of craving some abstract thinking, so I figured, what the hell, why not? Anyway, so yeah, we have those three scholars now, and between them, they've written only six books in these past five years. And I'll tell you what, they're pretty unimpressive books. <laughs> in fact, they're not books at all, I guess. Let's go over them real quick. First off, let's get this out of the way. All the books are bound in gold. Gold bound books, isn't that impressive? They certainly seem impressive, don't they? Well, they're not at all, because without exception, every book that's been written so far has been a one page essay or manual or guide, one page bound in gold. Yeah, I think we're still trying to figure out the concept of books here in the fortress. We're getting there. We're getting there. Anyways, Arel has written For the Love of the Mountain Halls, a one-page essay that concerns the book Questions About the Animal Trap, another book written by Arel, which is a one-page essay about the creation of an animal trap artifact made here in the fortress that was made by Arel. So in summary, Arel made an animal trap artifact, then wrote a book about its creation and then wrote a second book about the writing of the book about the creation of the artifact. And both books are one page long. Bound in gold. Excellent. And they also wrote one last book entitled A Skull Horror, The Frigid South Nightmare Fortress of Death in the Time of My Ancestors, which is a one page guide about the fortress here. And as for Nil and their three books, they wrote A Course on the Dwarves, which is a one page essay concerning when Nil became a scholar from being a farmer in 286 which I believe is that first time we had all the dwarves down here studying. Nil also wrote A Record on the Mountain Halls, which is a one-page essay concerning when they became a scholar from being a farmer in 287, the following year. 
super boring books. But I saved the best one for last because we actually had a strange event here in the fortress that I've never seen before. I think Nil is really starting to get a hang of this whole studying book writing thing. Starting to get a hang of it, I said. You see, at one point we had this message pop up. The scholar Nil Libadarib has discovered the surgical method of suturing due to their research, which is pretty exciting. I've never seen this happen before. A research breakthrough, I think it's called. It also means that at some point down the line, Nil will become a great suturer, I think, if they keep studying. Not quite there yet. Anyways, after Nil made this discovery, they wrote Exploring Sutures, a one-page manual about surgical sutures, written in extremely amateur fashion. But still, I think it's probably our most valuable book in terms of knowledge contained. A prized possession, I tell you. And as for Phycod, our third scholar, well, they haven't written any books yet, but I have high hopes. I don't know, I just have a feeling this dwarf's gonna write something uh, real good, probably an actual book. Hoping whatever they write has more than one page. <sighs> Anywho. Oh, here we go. Looks like that baby just finished their artifact. That is extremely exciting. Let's have a look. That baby Akmeshalath, the dwarven child, has created Noleth Neural Italnakol, a spore tree figurine of goblins. She claims it as an heirloom in the name of the family ancestor Caesar Trailarch, her father. The one that never took care of her in the fortress. Wow, that is miserable. Jeez, okay. Let's have a look. Its name translates to Gulf Blinded, the neutrality of riddles, and it's worth 56,000, which is respectable. This is a spore tree figurine of goblins. All craft horseship is of the highest quality. The item is a masterfully designed image of goblins and dwarves in spore tree by that baby. The goblins are fighting with the dwarves. The artwork relates to an attack on the Diamond Guild, a group from our civilization, by the goblins of the Torment of Quickness in the late spring of 272, during Ongakak, the monstrous assault. It is encrusted with round red zircon cabochons, cushion quartzite cabochons, and cushion schist cabochons, and also decorated with pig bone. This object menaces with spikes of red zircon and gabbro. On the item is an image of a forgotten beast in spore tree, as well as an image of oval cabochons in gabbro. Pretty cool, very unique actually. Interesting that we have a spore tree figurine of goblins. It's pretty cool to have it all green like that, plus that forgotten beast image. Very cool, big fan. That baby? I'm so happy you didn't die. Good job. He might not have cared that much in life, but there's no way your father could not have been proud of this. Okay, looking good, dwarves. Now let's see, we've covered the living area, the library. Hmm, we have our tavern down here. And right when we left off last episode, I tried getting all the dwarves down here for an extended period of time, just so I can get some nice socialization in and also get their fill of alcohol. We had a ton made and two tavern keeps. Remember Twitch was? and also Libash, other miserable dwarf. Now, we ran into a few problems with that. I was observing them and, I mean, the tavern keeps actually did a pretty darn good job when they weren't like panicking and freaking out and stuff. And they would go over, grab some alcohol and serve it to everyone like really fast, like incredible. And I started noticing dwarves like, you know, getting dizzy or vomiting. Okay, that's fine. It's like a, like a party atmosphere, sure, dwarves. But then I noticed a couple of individuals just unconscious on the ground. Okay, all right, unconscious. Mild alcohol poisoning. And then I noticed a couple of dwarves, including Kalovi, our mayor, unconscious and not breathing on the ground. And so, like, you know, of course I got pretty panicked. I took those tavern keeps off duty, and eventually Kalovi started breathing again, and then got up, vomited a couple times, and then, you know, went back to work. But wow, that was pretty harrowing. For a while, I was trying to use one tavern keep, but it just kept happening. Like a dwarf would, you know, be vomiting already, and the tavern keep would go up and just start pouring drinks down their throat, I guess. Yeah, it's it's kind of dangerous. We haven't had any tavern keeps in a while, not since then. I don't really want to risk zombification down here in our tavern. Wouldn't be great. Would not be a stellar thing at all. Kind of stinks, but I don't know. I even tried a couple of different dwarves as tavern keeps, one of whom was Inod one of our starting dwarves, who instead of serving alcohol, just started like drinking it herself, I guess, went unconscious, stopped breathing briefly. And so, yeah, we don't have tavern keeps anymore. A bit risky. I don't know what's up with that. Kind of stinks, but the dwarves are happy regardless. Noticing here that we have a couple of destroyed workshops in our workshop area. I can only imagine it was Twitch's doing. That damn dwarf, I'll tell you. 
Also, as I said before, looking here in the Justice tab, you can see we have a couple of counts of vandalism up there, as well as some disorderly conduct, but nobody seemingly witnessed anything, which is strange. I know somebody must have been there for it. But of course, I can't just go convicting Twitch for something she didn't do. Put that in quotes. So, whatever, I guess we'll just leave it be for now. Somebody get over here and rebuild these workshops, please. And thank you. Okay, let's see. We've covered living area, library, and tavern. Remember last episode we were working on armor and weapons as well. We were trying to make enough full suits of copper armor for every dwarf in our fortress, as well as silver warhammers. Yeah, we still haven't found any better metal, by the way. Copper, silver, and gold. It's all we got, apparently. But we can make do. It's fine. Over here you can see it all stocked up in these bins, copper bins. We're almost entirely out of wood these days, and so we've been using a lot more copper for this sort of stuff. Anyways, copper bins filled with copper armor and silver warhammers, enough to equip everyone in the fortress. Now, we only trained very briefly with them, but I think I'm gonna set them all to training for a while at some point. Gonna have to build up a nice stockpile of food and drinks first, though, as well as get some of our projects out of the way. All right, you know what? I almost forgot. We left off last episode before that artifact was created. Remember, that armorsmith was working on something. Let's have a look at that real quick. That artifact ended up being Idanin Sel Angetlin Lar, Sturgangs, the Turquoise Bird, a Gold Greaves, which is pretty okay. I usually prefer a helmet, a shield, a breastplate, something else, but this is fine. It's worth 132,000, so I really can't complain that much, I guess. This is a Gold Greaves. All craft ship is of the highest quality. It is encrusted with round diorite cabochons and encircled with bands of rectangular diorite cabochons rose-cut green glass gems, and pigtail. This object menaces with spikes of gold, diorite, morion, and pigtail. Very cool. Pretty boring, really, when you get down to it, but you know what? I still like it. It's clearly a wonderful artifact, and we'll be sure to make it another point of pride for Skull Horror. Whenever we do get a military, we'll have to assign it to its leader. Hoping to do that at some point. The whole military thing. And one of the main reasons I want a military is because, well, if you look down here, you can see this dwarf, locked in this chamber. A reanimated dwarven corpse, that is. Yeah, it was yet another dwarf that did not have enough materials to make an artifact. We really don't have access to too, too much down here. We have plant cloth for days, and we just started getting silk from the spiders that creep in from the caverns. They spin webs here and there, and we're able to collect that silk and make cloth. But we do not have any access to wool. And there's quite a few other materials, too, that we need access to. Food, for one. We're basically stuck eating underground crops and pig meat, and that's about it. We need more variety here. What I'm trying to say is that we have to be able to trade. Plus, when you get down to it, it would be nice to receive word from the outside. It can get a little boring locked up underneath an undead hellscape, believe it or not. And so I'm trying to think of a way where we can safely trade with the merchants. And you know, I think I did figure something out but uh, I suppose we'll see what happens. Speaking of Skull Horror's projects, but something I would really like to do is make a proper tomb with individual tombs for every single dwarf in the fortress. Feels a little improper to just cram all their bodies into a single room, a room that is quickly filling up. A lot of these slabs had to be engraved for migrants that died up above. It's not really a respectable way to remember our dwarves, I don't think. And that's why we forged these 50 copper sarcophagi. Still don't know how we're gonna do this, but We'll figure something out. Oh, you know what? We could probably put something down here. I mean, certainly it's a big enough area. All oh, right, you probably have no idea what this is. Well, remember our mines from last episode? Well, I figured it was a nice big area and we had discovered this section of caverns out to the west. So why not do something with it? And so in half-assed fashion, I kind of just started channeling downwards. We went down one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine levels where you can see the bottom, absolutely littered with boulders and gems. It's a mess, big time. The dwarves have been busy at work trying to throw all these rocks down through this chute, which will direct them down to the smelter lair, where we have a garbage disposal. It should work out pretty well, but first we have to get all the rocks dumped down there, so it's gonna take some doing. Now, the reason I had dug out this enormous room is so that we can hopefully get some water down here and turn it into a nice, safe area to grow trees in. Mushroom trees, of course. Plus, it would give us a nice little forest area to hang around in a bit. Might be cool. We're almost entirely out of wood, and although we don't need it that much, it would still be nice to have a supply. Plus, you know, it would certainly be a change of scenery. Something a bit more natural without being as bright as the surface. I don't think these dwarves could handle sunlight at this point. 
Now over here at the western side, if we look up quite a ways, all the way to the top, you can see this line of fortifications carved into the wall, just so the dwarves can kind of see out, get some fresh cavern air. Turns out it was a terrible idea, of course it was a terrible idea, because every once in a while something wanders too close to these fortifications and it freaks out all the dwarves inside. I don't know why I always think fortifications looking out into the caverns is going to be a good idea. It, it just never is, it never is, at all. Foolish. But it hasn't been that big of a problem. Yet, yeah, this cluster of naked mold dog corpses was visible for a while when they came out on this ledge up here. Yeah, the dwarves did not like that, and there's been a few other problems too out there, but most of them wander away in time, fortunately. That being said, there is quite a few corpses out there in the caverns, like a lot, and it's a little terrifying. Living creatures do pop up from time to time, and if this horde of zombies notices it, those creatures are completely enveloped immediately and absolutely destroyed. And most of the time they come back as a zombie and join the horde. It's a big mess. And like a zombie horde is terrifying and all, but I really want to point out this one right here, who's been one of my favorite zombies down in the caverns from the very beginning. You can see him here just kind of freaking out, shooting out this gas all over the place intermittently. This corpse here is known as Quadtebactor, the corpse of Azrazum. Its name translates to Flank Jackals. Flank Jackals is a great three-eyed python. It has thin wings of stretched skin and it squirms and fidgets. Its pale blue scales are round and set far apart. Beware its noxious secretions. And this thing has been dead for quite some time as well. And, <laughs> oh that's sad. Its heart is broken. <laughs> like literally. And in fact its heart is gouting Flank Jackal's forgotten beast blood. And also its teeth are broken and smashed open. Not good. This big bastard is the reason we locked up the caverns in the first place. And when it first appeared, it was kind of minding its own business for a bit, sitting off in the western caverns. And eventually, a second forgotten beast popped up. A great horned spider, named Taxmo. Now, Taxmo fought with Flank Jackals here, and killed Flank Jackals. Poor Flank Jackals didn't stand a chance. But after the fighting, the spider went off minding its own business, and Flank Jackals came back as a zombie, who hunted down that spider and killed it. And also it mangled the corpse of the spider, so it could not come back as a zombie. And after the death of Taxmo, Flank Jackals has pretty much ruled over the western caverns. The corpse lord of its domain. It slew a great many creatures out here, about half of which turned into zombies afterwards. Of those creatures, it slew at least two more forgotten beasts. Three, I think? With very little trouble. Pretty remarkable, really. These days it seems fairly contentious to sit down in this muddy pool, spraying its gas all over the place, and devouring any creature that wanders too close to the water's edge. But admittedly, it's been quite a while since that's happened. Too many zombies out there now. No living creature can even get close anymore. Keep on keeping on, you big bastard. May your legend grow still. Well, I think that'll do it for the updates in these past five years. I'm pretty sure I've covered everything. Just in time for the very end of the episode. <laughs> yeah, I know it's a bit different than usual. But it was still an interesting trip, I'd say. Not a lot happened in those five years, but because I did it this way, we were able to see all the interesting bits in one fell swoop. Which I kinda like. Let me know what you think. Wrapping things up now, and I will note that a weaponsmith is creating an artifact down here in the smelter lair. Very exciting, gonna save it for next episode, sorry. My bearded bastards, I truly hope you enjoyed watching today, and I certainly hope to see you next time here in the Kolkazoth I Shalal de Sathkishad Rash. Skull Horror, the frigid south nightmare fortress of death. And until then, you bearded bastards.